Uh, Jesse, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so I was wondering, I saw your video about um, language attrition um, that mm -hmm. we had in common. So first, um, could you talk about, could you introduce yourself a little bit? Um, can you talk about who you are and what you're doing? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is Jesse. And right now on YouTube, I'm mainly just making videos about um, ideas surrounding language learning and also ideas with uh, learning a new language from scratch and kind of limiting myself in what I'm doing while learning that language. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing it more as an experiment. And uh, I've so far, my native language is English and I learned Japanese to, uh, I wouldn't say like near native or anything like that, but uh, to a fairly advanced level. And I started learning Italian this year. That's great. Um, so what is your story of learning Japanese and Italian? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Japanese, I've been learning for quite a while. I, uh, my mom is Japanese, actually, uh, but I only learned greetings from her. So like um, for hello and goodbye and I'm home and things like that. And uh, I went to classes starting in fifth grade when I was 10 years old. And so I, I was in school for almost every year. I think I skipped uh, two years, maybe, yeah. uh, from fifth grade until college. And I did uh, study abroad at that point. And, you know, all throughout the schooling, I was doing pretty good in yeah. classes. So uh, I was getting, I don't know if you guys have uh, letter grades or, or scores, but I would get like above 90% on basically yeah. everything. Yeah. And um, so I thought I'd be okay when I went to Japan, but I arrived in Japan and I couldn't understand anything that anybody said, uh, <laughs> which was which was kind of a wake up call for me. Yeah, it's um, the experience. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely surprising. But um, I did the study abroad. It really helped me improve uh, my Japanese skill. And uh, after I got out of school, I did more research into how to study on my own because at that point I only really knew about like textbook studying. Yeah. Um, with Italian, I'm doing it uh, more as an experiment uh, rather than like trying to, to really go as efficiently as possible. Um, and so with this experiment, I'm really limiting uh, what I'm allowing myself to do. So I, I'm basically trying to do it with zero study at all since yeah. study was all I did for Japanese um, and so mainly I'm just reading books and I'm watching uh, Netflix TV shows and movies and uh, the occasional YouTube video as well. Yeah. You studied those two languages at the same time how do you manage your time? Uh, so I studied only Japanese for uh, pretty good portion yeah. of my life and I was only doing Japanese at that point. Um, right now I would say I'm primarily focused on Italian. So in terms of uh, studying or like uh, getting myself to use the language, um, I'm putting like on the weekdays uh, probably 90% of my free time is going into something with Italian. Um, and I'm not really studying Japanese anymore. Uh, I get so, it. yeah, I wouldn't have, I, I don't think I would say that I have studied Japanese for the last uh, four years, maybe three years or so. Because um, you mm -hmm. are getting into a native level, right? Yeah, well, I'm getting, I'm getting high enough to yeah. the point where like all the grammar that I'm learning is uh, yeah. not super useful um yeah so it's, it's yeah it's kind of like I, I open up a grammar book and they say yeah this is what a news reporter would say uh yeah. you don't really use it in conversation and Definitely. so I don't I don't care too much about learning that so um <laughs> I kind of skip it uh but um also I'm at the point where I can just enjoy movies or tv shows um I I wouldn't say I understand every single thing 100% all the time, but I understand a vast majority of what's being said 
Um, so I don't really study Japanese per se. I think we are on the same page. I don't study English anymore. Um, and I'm in a phase that I want to share my knowledge with others. So, you know, I do have a YouTube channel and I never mm -hmm. study grammar. I try mm -hmm. to consume as much as natural, naturally. So, um, yeah, I'm not okay with grammar. I mean, our relationship is not fine, but I, I do like naturally, you know. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think um, you're able to communicate your thoughts and ideas very well. So I don't think it's really a problem at all. Yeah. Um, so we can say that you are more fluent in Japanese, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, how about when you speak, so you can able to at least speak basic Italian. Um, how about when you feel, uh, like, what do you feel when you speak Japanese or Italian? Is it like the feeling of, you know, they say um, a, a language, a person. So do you feel differently when you speak Japanese or Italian other than when you speak your native language, which is English? Uh, yeah, I was actually thinking about this question since you sent it over to me. And um, I'll be honest, I don't think I, I change all that much. Um, what I do think happens, I think there's two things that happen uh, primarily. So the first one is that uh, parts of my personality get emphasized uh, yeah. with different languages. Um, so definitely with Japanese, like uh, I'm, I'm a bit more subdued, I suppose. So I'm not as, uh, I'm not really all that outgoing of a person in general, but I'm even less so in Japanese. Um, or like I'm, I'm much more conscious about uh, politeness levels. So mm -hmm. in English, I'm fine speaking casually with uh, certain people, but in Japanese with the same people, I wouldn't speak casually with them. Yeah. Um, and I try not to ever. Um, the other thing that happens that I think is pretty interesting is that my voice changes uh, from English and Japanese. Yeah. So I don't know if this happens to everybody, but my voice in English is much lower than my voice in Japanese. Yeah, definitely. Um, it happens to me. I know that situation. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So personality wise, I don't think I, I change all that much. Just certain things get emphasized a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but that's about it. So how about, um, have you ever been in a situation, you speak Japanese or let's say Italian, um, but you're speaking English, your native language, and there's a situation, specific situation that fits that a new term, a phrase, an idiom that you learn in Japanese. And you think that if I use that idiom in that situation, it would be fit, perfectly fit. So have you ever been in a, such a case? How do you will deal with these situations when you face, when you encounter such a situation? Yeah, yeah. Usually it's uh, it's just a really awkward fumbling of of words, and I I usually if I can only think of Japanese uh, in the moment, then I just tell uh, whoever I'm talking to is like uh, only Japanese is coming into my head right now, until English hopefully pops back in. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are a couple of phrases in Japanese that there's not like a really good English translation for. Uh, so there are a few phrases that, you know, I kind of wish uh, we could use uh, in English a little bit easier, but it's just not there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think usually when that happens to me, it's because I'm in like a, a certain language in my head. Um, so I haven't, I, I, I think it might be different for people who do like translating or interpreting or flip between languages uh, on a pretty regular basis. Uh, for me personally, I, I kind of compartmentalize my language. So it's like I, I'm typically speaking language uh, like uh, Japanese, for example, with these uh, uh, people in this group of people in my life. Yeah. And then I'm usually speaking English in this situation. Um, so I think because of that, uh, when I'm in kind of this English situation, it's actually really hard for me to think about almost anything in Japanese. Yeah. And when I'm in the Japanese situation, it's pretty difficult for me to think about anything in English. Um, <laughs> so I think in those situations, it's it's really hard for me to come up with a different language. Yeah, the people who know more than two languages, um, like face with the situation a lot. And in those situations, converting should be really fast. And if not, 
um, like situation becomes getting awkward, you know? So do you think that um, language learners should buy a plane ticket, ticket to, know, to learn a new language? Is it necessary? Um, uh, is it necessary? I don't think it's necessary. Um, I think it can help, uh, but I think it, it gives a couple of specific benefits, um, which, you know, might not be available for everyone. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you're a, a straight beginner, if you don't know the language at all, um, buying a plane ticket and just dropping yourself somewhere, um, you know, you might be able to get by with some broken uh, bits of the language to survive. Uh, but I think that it's going to be pretty difficult unless if you have some sort of foundation um, in the language first. Uh, the thing that I think, you know, buying a plane ticket, doing a study abroad program and things like that, the biggest benefit that it gives you is time, um, especially if you're doing study abroad and you're really focused on learning the language you're able to have all this time to focus on that language. Yes. Um, and that might not be available to you if you're living in your home country. However, I mean, there's plenty of examples online of people becoming uh, very fluent in a number of different languages without ever traveling to any country that speaks that language. Definitely. So, yeah, so I wouldn't say it's uh, necessary to go abroad in any sense. Okay. Um, yeah, I am one of the example of that situation. Mm -hmm. So what can you say about, um, in the beginning of this um, interview, you said that I studied Japanese uh, for long, for many years. But when I went to Japan, Japan um, it was like, I don't understand anything, like mm -hmm. what they are saying. So what is the, what can you say about the experience of le uh, learning Japanese where it's spoken and what can you say about learning a language, which is Italian, on your own at home? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I mean, definitely being in the country where the language is spoken, it provides you with obviously way more opportunities to use the language and to hear the language in different contexts. And in contexts that you might not uh, have available if you're studying at home, right? It's just not something that's really necessary for you to know. Um, but uh, studying completely at home, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to say this because I'm doing a very specific thing with Italian. I'm trying to do like zero studying at all, which means I'm not looking at like uh, charts of numbers. I'm not trying to memorize colors or shapes or anything like that. And so what ends up happening is that uh, there are some, for example, numbers that I've never seen before. So I have no idea what yeah. <laughs> it sounds like or what it is. Um, so uh, my, my experience with Italian is probably not going to be similar to many language learners. Um, but I do think that, uh, especially if you're an outgoing person and if you enjoy talking to people in whatever language and you like just meeting new people, definitely being in the country helps. Um, yeah. I mean, you can get, uh, uh, you know, part of the experience definitely from doing kind of like online classes or online interviews or things like that. Um, and really the only parts that you might be missing in is like uh, going to the store or something like that, or like, you know, hearing the price of what I, whatever item you need. But, um, uh, you know, be between that and between making a friend, uh, definitely the friend is yeah. much more important. So, you know, that's what, right. That's what we're all going for. So, um, yeah, definitely being in the country is really fun. Uh, but, you know, consuming content from that country, uh, whether it be through books or from videos, I mean, I think it's also really enjoyable. So I'm, I'm enjoying both uh, types of learning for sure. Yeah, that's, that's great. I hope one day I will also have an experience to go abroad where English is spoken. I hope. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so um, what are the difficulties when you you face when you speak with native Japanese speakers? Yeah, I think um, some of the big difficulties. I mean, I've I've never really been great at grammar, um, and that's uh, both when I was studying it. Uh, Kind of really directly and also through this more just immersion kind of style 
um, I don't know, for, for whatever reason, grammar just doesn't really click for me sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, there's a lot of times that, uh, for example, native speakers might not entirely know what I'm talking about because I might flip like a, a really small uh, word. Uh, I think we call it particles or something, but it's, it's kind of similar to like um, is or to or in or at in English. Uh, so every once in a while, I'll, I'll flip uh, one of those and then the native speaker I'm talking to gets super confused. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But um, or, you know, uh, people say that pronunciation is pretty easy in Japanese. I actually think it's pretty difficult. Um, yeah. So sometimes that I run into difficulties with that as well. In terms of like on on a more normal basis, uh, I think a, a, something that happens to a lot of uh, Japanese language learners is if you speak uh, any amount of Japanese, uh, many of the people that you meet are going to be very encouraging. Uh, so they're mostly uh, the Japanese people that I uh, run into that I meet, they aren't expecting me to be able to speak Japanese. Oh, and yeah. So when I do speak Japanese, they're really, really happy. They like any Japanese that I can produce, uh, they're ecstatic that I'm trying to learn Japanese at all. Yeah, I mean, it was also my next question, like how Japanese people are reacting to you when you speak their language. So they feel quite happy, as I understand. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely that's the uh, uh, pretty common reaction is <laughs> yeah. uh, them being happy to try to talk with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, are they more interested in, because you are a foreigner, so they are trying to build a relationship with you? Or um, as I heard, I mean, as I know, as much as I know, um, Japanese people are more close to each other and they do not like look like they're not so friendly with foreigners. So what do you think about that? Mm, I mean, it's definitely going to depend on the person that you're talking with as yeah. with, you know, anything else. Um, definitely. I, I mean, yeah, I think that you're going to you're gonna run into both types of people, the type of people who don't really uh, want to talk with you all yeah. that much uh, um, because they feel like maybe there's constraints on the conversation, right? They can't express themselves uh, and be immediately understood all the time. Yeah. And maybe it's hard for them to understand what you're saying. So uh, some people might not really enjoy uh, being in the conversation. Um, other people are going to be really ecstatic to learn anything about you um, yeah. and to learn about your culture and your country and uh, you as an individual. Um, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Steve Kaufman. Yeah, but he has, I know him. Yeah, very well. okay. All right. Well, I, I, I watched a video of his uh, maybe about a month ago, and he said something that um, uh, really stuck with me. And he's it's something along the lines of, uh, you know, every country I've been to and every person I've met in every country uh, was pleasant. And, you know, I had a great time talking with anybody. Uh, but the next thing he said was, that doesn't actually mean that everybody was nice to me all yeah. the time. Uh, what yeah. it means is that I choose to remember who was nice to me. I choose yeah. to remember who was pleasant and who I had a great conversation with. Anyone who was rude to me, uh, I chose to forget them and Definitely. you know not give them any worth in my head yeah. um and i think that that's a really great way to think about it as you're you're going through learning any language and trying to talk with people in that language yeah definitely i agree with that um so since you live in japan um do you able to fully immerse yourself into japanese language because there are some cases people are going um but um they come back with no progress so what about right. your situation yeah um you know i let me go ahead let me uh talk a little bit about the study abroad experience as well okay. sure. um, because i think that that really highlights what you just said so i did a three and a half month study abroad um where there were 18 kids from different countries um who all came to this one university and we were paired up with uh 
uh, Japanese students going to the same university. So we were their roommates, uh, basically. Yeah. Um, and we were all different levels. Um, so I think that there was uh, four, four levels. Um, and uh, we had two students in the first level. And actually one of them didn't know anything. They didn't know the writing system, the Japanese writing system. And uh, he couldn't really couldn't speak or do anything uh, more than like Ohio or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's other people who are pretty advanced and they could have conversations. Um, maybe they stumble once in a while, but, you know, uh, they can express themselves. Now, uh, by the end of the three and a half months, uh, one of the guys who knew nothing about Japanese he was able to give a kind of like a farewell speech without using any flashcards, uh, without any notes or anything. And he gave the speech in Japanese completely. And um, it was a really, really good speech as well. Uh, and he was really proud that he could do that. And, you know, I thought it was amazing he could. Um, there was another guy that was in one of the higher levels, uh, yeah. but he basically never did anything in Japanese like during class he would speak English a lot and yeah. uh, uh, he would go to like clubs and and things like that at night and um, I, yeah. I guess at the club they mainly spoke English so he <laughs> yeah. did his very best to not use any Japanese <laughs> while yeah. he was on the study abroad and of course he didn't really he kind of stagnated and everybody else kind of got better yeah um so I think that it it definitely depends on the kind of environment that you're creating for yourself in any uh, in any country. It doesn't matter. So, um, if I'm an American and I'm in Japan, it's pretty easy for me to create a ja uh, sorry an English environment. Um, I can spend all day uh, yeah. listening to English, and the only Japanese I'll hear is uh, maybe this is the amount that you owe me at the store. Yeah. Um, uh, and you can create for example, a Japanese environment in America um, pretty easily, right? Um, for me, I try to immerse as much as I can. Uh, I think now I'd be okay because I'm, I'm kind of at the point where I can enjoy uh, media, enjoy books without thinking too much. So I, I can immerse much better now, personally. Yeah. Um, when I was not so advanced. Um, I tried to really get into immersion, uh, but I think I did it with the wrong mindset. I, I did it more like as as a uh, work, like as this really, yeah. you know, like as a lesson. Of, right, right, right. Yeah. And I was trying to do that constantly, basically. Um, so there was some times that I got really stressed out, and yeah. the only thing I was allowed to do in English was I could listen to some English songs. Uh, so I would just like lay on my bed and just have <laughs> English songs playing <laughs> when yeah. I got too stressed out. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, but um, uh, right now, currently this year, I I almost don't touch uh, Japanese. I the only Japanese I do is I watch uh, a couple of TV shows with my girlfriend. Yes. Um, but yeah, well, like I said, it's almost ninety percent uh, Italian right now. Yeah. So. Since you are learning Italian on your own, um, with no too much effort, um, like quite naturally, what can you recommend to self learners to start from? Should they watch TV shows? Uh, should, should they start from reading textbooks or grammar books? What do you recommend to them? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And, you know, I don't think I would make a blanket recommendation at all. I think it really depends on your goals. So uh, for example, I, I kind of have two goals. Um, my first goal is to travel to Italy. Now with that kind of goal, if that was my only goal, um, I, I would be hesitant to recommend uh, like just watch a bunch of video or movies or whatever, just like read a bunch of books. Um, if, if all I wanted to do was like travel and be able to talk to the hotel staff and the restaurant staff in Italian or like get directions, Yes. Uh, that would be where I'm putting almost all my focus is yeah. studying those phrases that would really help and um, 
uh, get me like the skills that I need really, really quickly. And I would, if that was all I wanted to do, um, I would be uh, recommending to start speaking much earlier um, to really get those phrases down. Um, I don't know. Do you know Ollie Richards by chance? Um, yes, I know him as well. Um, he, okay. She, he's the he's the founder of Short Stories, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I've I've talked about his short stories in a few of my videos. Yeah. Um, but actually, uh, for this one, he made a really interesting video a few weeks ago, and it was about how Mormons learn any language in nine weeks. Yeah. And so he he clears he clarifies it more um, in the video, but I thought it was really interesting. So uh, basically, they they really limit the type of language that they're learning. They're learning the language so that they can convey a very specific meaning, um, which is you know this is what uh, the Bible says, and this is uh, how God views you, and things of that nature. Yeah. And after the nine weeks, when they got that skill down, they're kind of just shipped to the country. Um, and at that point, they can speak pretty fluently about this one topic, uh, but they can't really function in other aspects, right? They yeah. have no idea how to go to the store, how to ask for something. And so when they're in the country, uh, they're uh, expected to continue their studies and to continue trying and, and through trying and putting in all that effort, they get this uh, fluency in other aspects of yeah. the language, right? So. I mean, if you have a really, really specific goal and that's all you want from the language, yeah. um, then I think that's fine. And I think it's fine to get books that have those phrases and really practice them and be diligent about it. Um, my other goal in learning Italian. Yeah, second goal. Is to, yeah, the second goal. And it's a much broader goal. It's much uh, wider. I just want to have an experiment to see how much I, of the language I can learn uh doing literally well not literally i did a little bit of studying in the beginning with some flashcards but uh basically no studying at yeah. all um so for the i think i did flashcards for uh maybe one month or one and a half months um yeah. after that it, like no studying at all not i'm trying to not look up any grammar i'm trying to not look up any word lists or anything like that just consuming content yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's, uh, for me personally, um, it would be much better if I could find more content that's like made for beginners yeah. and like, you know, stories that are, that are interesting, but they have, you know, easy language or a shorter length or something like that. Um, actually, but actually that's a quite common problem, um, for English, there are tons, but for other languages, it's quite limited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so uh, that's another idea is to have some sort of foundation, um, you know, maybe go through a little bit of a textbook if you're unable to like fully get yourself into the language, if it just like freaks you out that you don't know yeah. what they're saying at all, um, then get a little bit of a foundation and then like immerse on the side. So I would still recommend if your if your goal is to become fluent and all or most aspects of the language um i would definitely rec recommend in general to immerse yourself in native like content so you're slowly getting used to that speed but if it freaks you out a little bit you know you can tone it down and you can get on the textbooks and like just memorize dialogues or um look at a couple grammar points or something like that yeah. um so you know Recommendation wise, I think it really depends on the the overall goal and the overall yeah. feel that people have when they're engaging with the language. I got you. Um, yeah, I, I will say, uh, even though I'm not doing any sort of like study, like straight up studying right now, um, you know, my language abilities aren't awful. Uh, I probably can't speak at all because. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've you never, can. I haven't tried yet. Yeah, I mean, I could say like a couple, a couple sentences maybe, yeah. um, but currently I'm reading Harry Potter in Japan or non-Japanese. Sorry, uh, I'm reading Harry Potter in Italian. Yeah, and 
you know, I definitely don't know every word, but I know a fair amount of them. So, um, you know, I think even without studying, uh, you'll That's be just so fine. Great. You, That's you awesome. Going. And I'm learning Korean and Chinese together. I'm trying at least. Oh. I don't have not extra effort um, like you do. I just try to learn naturally. But once I do that, I do have two little siblings. So for fun, we do use some apps such as Duolingo. Um, so mm -hmm. it's like a play. I tell them, do your homework, um, fold uh, down with this task, and I'm going to give, you, give it to you as a game. So we're going, or we're going to play together. So mm -hmm. what about, do you use, any application do you think they are fun to use like Duolingo um yeah yeah uh I don't know I don't know if my answer will disappoint you or not uh so the applications I use is uh Netflix YouTube Kindle and a dictionary yeah um I don't I don't use uh Duolingo or anything like that and once again it's it's kind of for the experiments uh, of it, the experience of um, trying to do all of this with no study at all. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's I'm really just focused on uh, reading books and watching movies and trying to like pick out uh, anything I can. Um, so what about do you feel like what is your motivation level? Do you feel motivated or when you feel unmotivated, what do you do about this learning Italian? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had a couple of things. Uh, uh, one thing is um, uh, one of my other kind of hobbies, my other interest is uh, exercising. Yeah. And so kind of one really big thing in the fitness community is uh, to have the discipline to do the thing every day Yeah. or almost every day, uh, even if you don't feel like it. Um, so even if you wake up and you're like, ah, I don't really want to watch another show in italian so you know what just put it on the background do it the first thing in the morning if you really really don't feel like it that day then yeah. skip the rest of the day but you at least did something uh, yeah. you at least did some of it um so that's one part is is uh even days where i don't feel motivated um this is just kind of the thing that i'm doing yeah uh, so it's i'm not really giving myself a choice in that case um there was, however, uh, maybe two months ago, uh, I was getting a little bit fed up, to be honest, because uh, yeah. uh, at that time, I had read some of the graded readers uh, a few times, and um, I was trying to find, like, kid shows to watch, um, and I wanted to graduate from that and graduate to, like, just regular books. Yeah, uh, it's really hard for me to find any sort of regular book. Um, I, I ended up I found a couple, but um, because of that kind of struggle and I, I created a reason for myself, I was scared my Japanese was getting worse because I wasn't yeah. really practicing it in any yeah. sense. Um, and so I went to I went back to Japanese and just like fully going uh, with Japanese all the time. Uh, and I found out that my Japanese actually didn't really get bad at all <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I didn't I really didn't feel like it changed at all so I figured you know if my Japanese didn't really change that much then uh, I might as well just keep going with the experiments and uh, see how far I can get and how long it yeah. takes me to get there um, so yeah so that's really it yeah I mean um, when you learn another language and when you work on another language sometimes I, I'm for me personally sometimes I feel like I'm afraid of that I'm going to lose my Turkish which quite happens to me a lot in a, when I'm in conversation with other, uh, with my family. Um, but mm -hmm. as you said, it just happens. Like we are teaching our brain how to think, how to express ourselves in another way. So it's quite normal and fine. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we keep learning. Like it's a lifelong, adve it's, it's a lifelong adventure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, actually, um, I, ha I have one more uh, person. I don't know if you'll know her or not. Do you do you know a person named uh, by the name of Judith Kroll? Judith Kroll? Um, no, no, I don't. Okay, I actually um, since we uh, started communicating uh, with that language attrition video, um, 
one of the other viewers, I think he sent me a link to Judith Kroll's uh, lecture, one of her lectures. Yeah. It was really, really interesting. I, I highly recommend it. Uh, she mentioned something called uh, language suppression. Yeah. And it was this idea that, um, for example, if there was uh, bilingual speakers and you gave them a bunch of uh, pictures that they need to describe in one word. So you give them a picture of a bicycle, they say bicycle, then you say cats, and then they need to say cats or whatever. When they went from uh, the first round they did in their native language, mm -hmm. the second round they did in their second language, mm -hmm. uh, there was a slowdown, of course, because it's their non-native language. Yes. Uh, but when they flipped it and they said, okay, first name these objects in your second language and then name them in your native language, the native language took a much bigger hit. So they were significantly slower in yeah. uh, uh, naming those objects with their native language. Yeah. So it's this idea that we have to suppress that native language in order to learn yeah. the second language. Yeah, uh, which was really incredible to me. I, I thought it was yeah. a really cool uh, yeah. lecture. When I speak Turkish, sometimes I use English adjectives before the Turkish noun. So it's quite amazing because I mean, quite amazing. Um, and also makes the situation awkward. My family looks at me like, um, can you say it again? Like, what is this? <laughs> I, this, I this happens to me a lot, I promise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of my friends, uh, uh, they'll kind of mix Japanese and English throughout their sentences as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it works if uh, the people that you're talking to know both languages. Uh, yeah. It works a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. Not as many awkward moments. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah. I wanted to ask you one thing, if I could interject here. Is that OK? Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. OK, yeah. I, I was wondering, um, you said that you're learning both uh, Korean and Chinese at yeah. the same time now. Um, I was wondering if when you're trying to think of some sort of sentence or, or uh, some sort of thought or anything yeah. in either Korean or Chinese, and you're seeing that there's a few gaps uh, in your knowledge, you can't completely form the sentence. Yeah. What language fills those gaps? Well, I'm quite a beginner. Uh, on both languages. I'm currently studying Hangul, mm -hmm. Korean alphabet. I'm practicing on it on Duolingo. And I do have another app, Hello Chinese, ca called Hello Chinese. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm just trying, learn to, trying to learn the basics. I'm just quite beginner. Mm -hmm. And a few mm -hmm. months ago, I was trying to learn Hindi as well. Uh, and I can just mm -hmm. speak quite really basic things like Greetings and what's my name, you know, stuff like that. But I'm mm -hmm. not in a level that um, to think in Korean, Chinese, or Hindi. I'm just beginner learner. And okay, I yeah, see. yeah, that's so. Yeah, I was just wondering because um, I'm all, I'm not at that point in Italian either. I can't yeah. just uh, start thinking in Italian. Um, there was a couple of times I attempted to, um, but I was really interested to find that when I was thinking in Italian all the gaps that I didn't know. Yeah. Like, for example, I, I didn't know um, how to express the possession of something, like it's his dog or something yeah. like that. Um, and what I found interesting was Japanese was filling the gaps yeah. and not English. I get it. And so I thought it, was, I thought it was interesting that my second language was filling in for my third language, but my first language was just like completely taking a backseat. Um, yeah. But yeah, once you once you start uh, trying to to uh, create sentences, I'd be really interested to know if you have a similar experience yeah. or if I'm the only one here. <laughs> yeah, we of course, I'm sure. I hope we're gonna be definitely talking about this when I'm getting and you're getting better on your Italian and my learning other languages. I hope. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. it'd be really cool. Um, so, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the conversation was really nice. Um, thank you so much for your time and for your patience. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It was really fun.